Today's topic will be the GSI Adara Pro ASSR test module. ASSR is an evoked potential test that uses modulated pure tones as the test stimuli. Each tone is modulated at a different rate. In the case of the Adara Pro, we are using amplitude modulation, which is simply on off, on off, on off, done at different rates for each frequency. The cochlea is stimulated by the tone, the brain perceives the modulation. So we're analyzing the brain at the modulation rates, or we're analyzing the EEG at those modulation rates. The analysis is statistical, so there's no waveforms to mark, peaks to mark, amplitudes to measure. It's done statistically and therefore is an objective measure. We perform ASSR to obtain frequency-specific thresholds when testing infants or any patient that's difficult to test. We can determine the type, degree, and configuration of the hearing loss by testing air conduction and bone conduction, and we can determine the severity of the hearing loss, particularly for severe to profound hearing losses because we can test at higher levels than we can with ABR test stimuli. When you launch the Audera Pro software, you're always going to open up to this window. It's called, we call it the opening window. In the lower right corner, this will indicate immediately that you're ready to test when you see a check mark. The computer is communicating with the Audera Pro device, so you're ready to test. The patient icons, add a patient, search for a patient, edit a patient, are in the upper left corner. And I always recommend that you enter the patient information from this screen. And the reason is if you're performing more than one test type, say ASSR and OAE, you would only have to enter the patient information one time and then you can navigate between the different modules and all that test data will be saved under that patient. If you're in a hurry and you launch the module right away, you'll be prompted to enter patient information, but if you don't, you may risk losing some of that test data. So go ahead and enter the patient information from this screen. Here you can see the information window. The only thing that's required is first name and last name. So you can quickly add those two pieces of information and fill in the rest if you want to at a later date. The identifier up at the top is automatically assigned. So you only have the two fields, uh, first and last, to fill in. Once you do that, you go back to the main screen and select the test module that um, you want to run. So when we go into the Audera Pro screen, this is what you see. We call it the acquisition screen, so you're ready to test immediately. The white area in the middle is the ASSR waveform area. You don't really analyze those waveforms in any way, they, but they will appear on the screen. The bottom of the window is what we call the collection toolbar, and that's where you can start a test, stop a test, change the intensity, etc. The stimulus information is in the upper right corner. This is where you will select the test frequencies that you're going to uh, be presenting um, to your patient. The side toolbar has a few icons that you will access fairly often during the test. And then on the right side is the EEG panel. So that will be live. As soon as you launch the software, you will see activity in the EEG. Nothing's recording. You can just see what, uh, the, um, what the electrodes are picking up. And then right below that is the impedance information. So to dis determine the test frequencies that you're going to present to the patient, you simply check them, check the boxes for the right and the left ear. By default, 5, 1, 2, and 4 for both ears are selected. And right above those check boxes, you can see the modulation rates for each frequency. So the lowest modulation rate is 77 hertz for 500 hertz in the left ear. And then the highest is the right ear, 4,000 hertz, which has a modulation rate of 103 hertz. So once you've selected your frequencies, you can select the Activate Stimulus button. Now when we do ABR, 
our filter settings and our gain settings are critical depending on the tests that we're collecting. So from ECOG to P300 to VEMP, those, those um, parameters change, but for ASSR, they're fixed. So you can't change the gain, it's 100,000. And the high pass and low pass filters are 30 and 300 hertz. And the reason for that is the modulation frequency. So we wanna capture the EEG between 30 and 300 hertz to ensure that we're going to pick up those modulation rates or the test data for each of the frequencies. There are a couple of other defaults settings for the stimulus. One is the maximum number of sweeps, which will be 400. So if a response is not detected, the test will automatically stop at 400. And then block size. So ASSR data is collected using block averaging. The smallest block size available is 20. And so what that means is 20 sweeps will have to be collected before the test data is updated on your screen. And you'll be able to see that during the collection. I wouldn't recommend increasing that because you could potentially be testing longer than you need to um, should a response appear. There are a couple of options for performing a test. You can um, perform an intensity sweep using an auto sequence that is provided, or you can test manually. So to do the uh, intensity sweep, you would go to the protocol dropdown, intensity sweep, and select right, left, or both ears. As soon as you make that selection, the test is going to stop. To, I'm sorry, the test is going to start. The starting intensity is always going to be 80 dB for this intensity sweep, and the step size, when you go down in intensity, is going to be 10 dB. The stimuli that are tested are any of the frequencies that you've activated. So this is hard-coded into the software, um, but it's there should you want to use it. For manually, manual testing, you can simply test, select the test frequencies, activate the stimuli, select your starting intensity, and then to start the test, select right, both, or left ear, whichever in, uh, condition um, you want to test, and then it will begin. Okay, so to perform a test on a patient, the easiest way is to use the four lead snap cable and the disposable electrodes. You're going to place the white electrode, or the positive, at the high forehead, the ground or black electrode on the low forehead, and then the red snap on the right ear, blue on the left ear. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some recordings. I've done these in my own ear while I'm sitting up in a chair, so they're not pretty, but it will show you all the different screens that um, you need to know when you're collecting an ASSR. So, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start the video. You can see I've selected the impedance icon and I'm waiting for the impedance to appear. It should be under five kilo ohms, just like ABR. You can see right above that, my EEG window is pretty noisy, so not surprising since I'm talking and sitting in a chair. Um, as soon as you start a test, I started both ears, the SNR and noise plot window is going to appear. Um, you can see in the upper left corner the number of sweeps, so I'm not seeing any test data yet on my screen until I reach 20 sweeps. As soon as I reach 20, you'll see waveforms appear, and you'll see plots on the SNR and noise graphs. Now, my test data is pretty noisy, but in a patient that's quiet or sleeping, you'll probably see regular peaks in your ASSR waveforms, but here is, it's pretty noisy. Um, again, because I'm not the ideal patient, I shouldn't be talking during the test. So, okay, let's move on. So now I'm getting a little bit further along in my recording. If you look at my sweep count, I'm up at 83 sweeps. If you look at my noise level, it's dropping, so I'm plotting my noise over the number of sweeps, and as I average, my noise level should go down. That's the principle of averaging. 
if you look at the stimulus information under the left and right ear, you can see 500 hertz has turned green for both ears. When that happens, that indicates that a significant response has been obtained at that frequency. Once my data has updated, that green has gone away in the left ear, and that's probably because the response that was detected was very small, uh, maybe borderline. So as the test is updating, you may see that um, frequencies become significant and then bright green and then change over time. But if it's a robust response, it's not going to change. Those responses will hold steady at significant. Okay, moving on. Now I'm up to 160 sweeps and I'm going to launch the polar plot window. So now I'm uh, collecting. You can see my noise level is going down even further. And I'm going to click on that icon in the side panel. And when you do that in the software, you can move these windows around. There's a lot of information to look at so you can view everything. The polar plot shows me um, the circular polar plot information for each test frequency uh, on the left side. The same data in a frequency um, graph or spectral graph and then specific data information in the data table. Okay, and then moving on to my la the last graph. Um, this is further along in the testing and now instead of the polar plot I've launched the audiogram. So this looks, I'm a little happier with this, I'm familiar with this, and you can see my stimulus information. I'm getting significant responses in the right ear at all frequencies and therefore those are plotting on my right audiogram. I have two significant responses in the left ear at 1000 and 4000 hertz and those are also plotted on my audiogram. I'm up to 318 sweeps before I pause the recording. So as you're proceeding through the test, I'm still at 80 dB. If you're getting significant responses for a patient, you would certainly stop and go down in intensity. And sometimes you do have to uh, decide whether to go with the green. So if you're getting significant responses consistently in one ear, let's say in this case, my case here at, um, in the right ear, you may want to decrease in intensity and obtain those thresholds for the right ear and then go back and retest some of the other frequencies in the other ear. Okay, so let's review these graphs one more time because it was kind of hard to do that during the collection. So your signal to noise ratio and noise plots will appear. Signal to noise ratio typically as you collect will increase. So you're averaging out the noise. So the signal, if it's there, uh, your response, it should be more prominent. And the noise always, that's the principle of averaging. The longer you average, the more noise uh, is averaged out over time. The bright green line and the noise graph is the stopping criteria for noise. So if noise gets down to 0.7 microvolts, you should be able to see a response there. And if it's not there, then you should probably stop the recording. So it will automatically stop once the noise gets that low. The stimulus information during collection, so remember before we started the test, we picked our frequencies and we activated it. During collection, they will turn bright green when a significant response is detected. So you can see here that 1,000 in both ears, 4,000 in the right ear has um, indicates that there is a response because it's in bright green. This is the same color that will appear in the polar plot. So you can monitor this screen as you're collecting. The polar plot um, has a lot of information, so I'm going to go through each of it, uh, each section. So for the polar plot, you have vectors. Those are lines. The longer the line, the stronger the response, so the bigger the amplitude. So if we look at the polar plot of this test data, the right ear responses are longer and therefore stronger. The circle at the end of the vector 
indicates the deviation. The smaller the circle, the smaller the deviation. So you're more certain that uh, a response is present. The frequency color, the, the, the actual frequency 4000 hertz spelled out, if it's in green, that means it's a response. Black means there's no response. And the vectors, of course, I didn't mention, the red is right ear, blue is left ear. Now the spectral graph is that exact same data plotted uh, in the frequency domain, so amplitude over frequency. The frequencies, if you look at those, are the frequencies of the modulation. So the blue lines indicate the left ear, the red lines indicate the right ear, and you can see that in the spectral graph that the amplitude of the right ear responses are larger than the left ear responses, just as you see on the polar plot. The data table in the lower left corner, you can check the data table box, and that gives you a lot of information about the frequency, the response, the amplitude of the signal, the signal to noise ratio, the phase, um, the noise, phase, um, standard deviation, etc. And then finally, down at the bottom is the record selector. So in this case, I'm looking at responses at 70 dB SPL, but I would have to select lower intensities if I went lower or different intensity levels to see the specifics of each one of those levels and the polar plots for each. And then finally, how do we know if there is a response? Well, the algorithm is when it analyzes the statistically the test data, the signal to noise ratio of has to exceed 6.13 to be considered a response. So that's what you're looking for, 6.13 .3 signal to noise ratio value. Uh, overall noise level should be below 0 0.05, so we don't want to inadvertently call a noisy response um, analyze a noisy response as present. So that's why we do require some, some low noise uh, amount below 0 0.05. Okay, moving on to the audiogram. So if you select the audiogram here, you can also see the significant responses that are plotted. So in the lower left corner of this window, you can select plot individual trial only or maybe just responses. So in this case, we're looking at every individual trial. So if we look at the right ear at 500 hertz, it, a response was obtained at 80, 70, 60, and 50, but not at 40. So we've plotted every one. So the other thing you can do, this is an SPL audiogram. If you want to look at the HL audiogram, so it's simply gonna convert that, you would select the general table um, down there in the bottom under the HL correction. For reporting, you can copy the audiogram to the page. So it's just gonna take that audiogram and stick it on the collection page that you're on. Or for reporting purposes, you could be on pages, any of the pages one through nine that are available, or you can print the audiogram directly. And when you do that, you're going to get an audiogram that looks like this. So that would be the easiest way to get your ASSR results um, <clears throat> printed. If you use copy audiogram image to report page, you can then use that if you've already done ABR and import that image into your ABR report. So you would have both ABR and ASSR in one report. Well, thank you so much for listening in. Look for other trainings on the GSI Audera Pro.